On this week's edition of New York Now, protests continue in Rochester over the death of Daniel Prude. John Campbell from the USA Today Network joins me with details. Uh, you know, there are serious questions about what she knew and when she knew it. New York's economy is in the gutter, but there could be a silver lining. Melinda Mack from the Association of Employment and Training Professionals explains. Overdose deaths spiked during the COVID-19 crisis. Senate Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Chair Pete Harkum joins me to discuss that and his upcoming election. And then we'll speak with Harkum's challenger, former candidate for governor and Westchester County Executive Rob Astorino about his message for voters. I'm Dan Clark, and this is New York Now. Today, the Senate majority will pass a legislation we'll pass a law that prohibiting it, it, and we will take them to court challenging it. Another stand uh, for New York and sending a message to the nation. Welcome to this week's edition of New York Now. I'm Dan Clark. Last week, we opened the show with news about the civil unrest in Rochester over the death of Daniel Prude, an unarmed black man who died after an interaction with police. And more happened this week. Protesters occupied Rochester City Hall, but were forced out by the police hours later. And there were some tense moments. Take a look at this video from our PBS affiliate in Rochester. All we did was just occupy this. And all you wanted was for us to clear the entrances and the parking which you have fully done, and yet you are still here in this full grip, ready department. to detain us all. Who are you guys arrest the killers that killed Daniel Kruger? Yeah. That is why we're here. Let's take care of one more time. Are, are you willing to arrest the killers? John Campbell from the USA Today Network has been following the situation closely. He's with me now in studio. John, thanks for being here. Hey, thank you for having me, Dan. So the protesters occupied City Hall this week, as we said before. What are they looking for at this point? Because the police chief resigned and then was subsequently fired by the mayor this week. It's kind of a weird situation. What are the demands, I guess? Well, they have they have four main demands, and one they're looking for, they're looking for resignations. They were looking for the resignation of the police chief. They got that resignation, but the Ron Singletary, the police chief, is going to step down at the end of the month. Uh, now, they're, the city hall, you know, there's been a lot of interest in this case, a lot of uh, freedom of information requests filed. City hall, the mayor, lovely Warren, uh, proactively released some of those documents, some of which showing uh, the police chief and a, a, a deputy uh, discussing how they, they wanted to be really careful with the release of the video of Daniel Prude's death uh, because they feared that it could incite a response like we saw with George Floyd that we've seen with other uh, similar police, uh, police killings in, in over the years. So, uh, they're, you know, they're looked to be something of a cover up here. And now there's this big debate about who deserves blame for that. So the mayor sped up the, uh, the resignation of the, uh, the police chief, fired him two weeks early, essentially. And uh, now we're in a situation where there's questions about how much responsibility the mayor deserves, how much responsibility state officials, local, local officials. I mean, there's a lot of people who knew about this and did not tell the public. How is the mayor reacting to all of this? Because she is relatively popular in Rochester, I think, but the, I believe the protesters were calling for her to resign herself, right? We, we, you know, we as journalists often use the word embattled to yeah. describe a politician, and I think it's certainly apt in this case, not only because, uh, you know, there are serious questions about what she knew and when she knew it. There was one email that she released where there was a, a reference to the mayor being, quote unquote, in the loop Mm. Uh, you know, she has denied that she, she knew that it was, she, she has said that it, at one point the, the police chief told her it was an overdose rather than, uh, you know, a death as the result of asphyxiation because police officers put pressure on uh, Daniel Prude's head. Uh, so she is certainly embattled not only for that, but also she's under investigation. Her campaign is under investigation for uh, campaign finance related issues with right. the, the State Board of Elections. Uh, independent investigator investigated that, referred it to the Monroe County District Attorney, uh, and there's going to be a grand jury impaneled for that soon. So uh, she, when you say the word embattled, in this case, it is, is truly, truly apt. So speaking of grand juries, the attorney general a few weeks ago said that she was impaneling a grand jury herself in the Daniel Prude investigation. As we explained on last week's show, that means that she is considering criminal charges. Yeah. 
Um, what does that look like? Do we know a timeline on that? I know the thing about grand juries in New York is that they're shrouded in secrecy. Shrouded in secrecy and also very backed up right now because of COVID-19. That's know? a really great point. Was, I didn't consider that. Yeah, so there's, there is a, a backlog of, of uh, grand jury cases, which could come into play here. Um, that being said, you know, the attorney general did take the kind of the extraordinary step, one that she might not usually take, uh, but given the, the public interest here, you know, she did announce that she will impanel a grand jury. That means they'll bring evidence to the grand jury and determine whether there's probable cause to uh, indict someone in this case. Likely, they're looking at the officers. So what do the police look like right now in Rochester? We know that last week uh, the, the police chief announced his resignation. Mm -hmm. Some of the command staff as well decided to leave the department. Um, what does what the police department look like right now? Is, is it a mood that it's police versus protesters? Right. Well, there's, I mean, there's no doubt. Literally, every single night you see police versus protesters. Right. I mean, you see these lineups in Rochester where, uh, you know, they'll, they stand up face to face, you know, a few feet away. That's what happened with the occupation of City Hall. Uh, that's how they, they ended up clearing it out. But that being said, you know, you have not seen the, the rioting and looting uh, in Rochester that you have seen in, in other places, in Minneapolis with George Floyd, for example. And, and that, is, that is certainly something to be recognized, that you know, these protesters do have a very clear, consistent message in terms of their demands, uh, and they have not resorted to the, the rioting and looting that has been criticized in other, other cities. All right, well, we are watching the situation as it continues to develop in Rochester. John Campbell from the USA Today Network, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Unemployment in New York has reached a new high, with the latest numbers showing an unemployment rate of about 16%. We haven't seen unemployment that high in more than four decades. And as New York starts to recover from the COVID-19 crisis, some say it's the perfect time to not only grow the state's workforce, but strengthen it as well. And that's going to cost money, but supporters say it would be well worth the investment down the road. One of those supporters is Melinda Mack from NIATEP, a statewide workforce development group. We spoke this week. Melinda Mack, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, I'm so glad to be here. Yeah, so New York City had an unemployment rate of up to 20% last month in last month's numbers. Even in Ithaca, unemployment was 9%, which is still very high, even for anywhere around the state. You're part of a group that says that the state could be doing more right now to ensure a stronger workforce recovery as the economy starts to recover. Tell me about your plan and what you'd like to see happen. Sure. Well, I'm so glad to be here to talk about this because I think as we've come across the pandemic, we're now at a point where we're realizing we've got millions of people out of work across our state and they're going to need to return to work at some point. And we have to have a plan in place to do that effectively. Um, as you described, the pandemic has caused massive unemployment across New York. I was just looking at the numbers before I came in. Um, we're close to over 5 million people who are on some form of assistance really That's around crazy. unemployment and assistance. Um, and when you think about that in the last economic downturn, we peaked at around 800, 850,000 people, right? So this is unprecedented by many, many standards. That being said, we shouldn't be sitting back and waiting for the economy to recover to get people back into employment. And I think one of the things that we've been looking at is who's been laid off and what types of sectors and industries are being impacted. But more importantly, what's the trajectory for the recovery, right? So when we look at the data, what we know is sectors like hospitality, tourism, retail are likely going to have high impacts. It's also going to impact primarily people of color and people who are low wage. Um, but ultimately, those are also going to take a while to recover. And so what we're, we're saying right now is the time to actually retrain individuals, people who want to go to the next level in their career, so that when we recover, we actually recover back better by having folks in better employment and better family sustaining jobs. So providing this workforce development and this skills training is obviously going to cost money. Of course, I'm yeah. assuming an investment from the state or the federal government. How do we pay for that when the state is facing a $14 billion budget deficit? I feel like every idea right now that says it's got a price tag is going to be, you know, round upon. Well, I was just on a call with the division of budget yesterday and they very clearly said we've got no cash in the coffers to spend on this, right? Yeah. Um, that being said, you know, workforce development is an important investment, just like economic development. Traditionally, what happens is in an economic downturn, the federal government comes in with a stimulus package that funds workforce at billions and billions of dollars. And so in the last economic recovery, it was around $5 billion that came out through the American Recovery Reinvestment Act. Um, we're asking for 15 point 
$6 billion to come out from the federal government to actually respond to the crisis of, of this magnitude. Um, we had high hopes that the federal government would fund it through the last stimulus before folks went away in August. Um, we're hoping now it happens before the election. Uh, but ultimately, the funding typically comes from the federal government. That being said, there are things we can do that don't cost money. And I think for our, from our perspective, it really is around thinking about the policy shifts that allow for flexibility with the dollars that we have. And so we were talking before we came on air, right? The fact that folks can, are unable to access internet and access computers at mm. the scale that are necessary, how do we loosen up the resources that we have to make sure that those are investments that are eligible for funding that we already have um, at our fingertips? So those are, kind of, those are the kinds of policy changes we're looking for. You know, this is such a complicated issue because even if we have the access to skills training and access to these jobs and loosening regulations, there are still some factors that are out of the control of people that are seeking these jobs and seeking yeah. these skills, like childcare. What are you going to do with your kids if you get a job? Or housing. What if you're a homeless person or living in a shelter? And how do you do that? So um, have you looked at issues like that in terms of strengthen our, strengthening our workforce while confronting these issues that are going to um, kind of prevent that growth? Yeah, and I will tell you, these are issues before the pandemic. They were huge issues before the pandemic. And it's one of those unfortunate realities that it took a pandemic to have people pay attention to it. Childcare has always been a significant issue. Housing has always been a significant significant issue. Transportation, right? These are the pieces, the building blocks that make the workforce system interdisciplinary in nature. So childcare, absolutely. I think one of the things that we've recognized is there's an equity issue around your ability to work remotely. And so right now what we're finding is the complicated factor around the return to school um, is actually creating a huge challenge in terms of parents, working parents' ability to actually return to work effectively. Um, I think one of the things that we were hearing, uh, primarily from uh, legislators uh, sort of in the Southern tier and other places, is that the $600 amount unemployment insurance sort of stipend that was being added onto your UI check was forcing people not to return to work or they were choosing not to return to work. The evidence doesn't bear that out, that 600 bucks is gone. You're not seeing a flood of people returning to employment. What we're hearing anecdotally on the ground, it's the childcare issue, it's still the concerns around safety, uh, but also because the wages are not there, right? It's, there's, why would you return to a low wage job and have to struggle to find childcare, as well as try to figure out what you're gonna do for transportation, especially if your bus line isn't running anymore. So I think, again, part of the challenge here is you have to look holistically at the people you're trying to get back to work, understand the barriers that they're facing and make the investments appropriately because that's how you actually get people to stick in the labor market. It is a hugely complicated issue and it's something that we have to keep our eye on, especially as we're coming out of this economic loss. It's just something that we can't ignore, strengthen our workforce. So Melinda Mack from the New York Association of Training and Employment Professionals, thanks so much. Thank you so much. Now let's turn to this year's elections. Democrats are fighting this year to keep their majority in the state Senate. Senator Pete Harcum is one of the Democrats who helped the party win the chamber two years ago. He won a close election against a Republican in the lower Hudson Valley. And now he's facing a challenge from Rob Astorino, the former Westchester County executive who ran for governor in 2014. But Harcum has at least one advantage. He's already been in the Senate for the last two years. And during that time, he's helped lead the fight against the state's opioid crisis as chair of the Senate Committee on Alcoholism and Substance Abuse. We spoke earlier this week. Senator Pete Harcum, thanks so much for being here. My pleasure, thanks for having me, Dan. Anytime. So we've seen the opioid crisis kind of expand during the pandemic. We've seen overdoses increase during that time during lockdown. Prosecutors have said that's because people have been shut in and there's obviously some mental health issues going on during the lockdown. You're chair of the Senate Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Committee. Tell me what you think the state should be doing right now and going forward to curb the opioid crisis as we come out of the COVID-19 lockdown. Sure, and, and we've heard from a lot of the providers um, and community groups about the rise in, in overdose death. Uh, and it is because of the despair, the isolation. Um, you know, recovery requires being with other people. And, and telehealth has worked very well in some cases, but I think the economic despair and, and the isolation are really hurting people. We've seen a spike in suicide. We've seen a spike in overdose deaths. And we had a crisis before we had a pandemic and this has only exacerbated it. So I'm very concerned about the state withholding 20% uh, 
uh, of reimbursements right now for uh, mental community mental health providers and substance use disorder providers. Um, we also need federal assistance. Nationally, the Behavioral Health Coalition is calling for $38 billion in assistance. You know, we as a country have underfunded behavioral health and community behavioral health services for far too long, and we need federal assistance in order to fill those gaps in the safety net. You know, before the pandemic, there was a conversation a year or two ago about these so-called supervised injection facilities. And I know that that was a big conversation up in Tompkins County or on Ithaca, obviously in New York City as well. What do you think about those? Because I know that they're really controversial. They would be places where people can use drugs under medical supervision, but also get access to some resources to hopefully help them with their addiction. What do you think about the idea? Should New York allow those facilities? Yeah, I, I think they should. In fact, as part of our opioid task force, we went up to Toronto. We visited one all throughout Canada. They've had no fatalities. Um, and it should be an opt-in. You know, if Ithaca wants to do one, great. If New York City wants to do one, great. Um, I don't think the state should be imposing them on places, but if municipalities want them, it should be an opt-in. And just as you said, they provide other services, access to health care. Have you had an HIV test? Have you had a hepatitis test? Um, are you ready to think about treatment, um, medication-assisted treatment? A whole host of, of options are available to folks, but the key goal is let's keep people alive. We can't get people into treatment if they're dying in isolation. You know, you mentioned uh, the people's finances before, and obviously taxes are a big part of that. In the district that you represent in the lower Hudson Valley, property taxes are higher than a lot of the state. And that's been true for many years in Westchester County uh, before you took office and on Long Island as well. What do you think the state could be doing moving forward to keep property taxes flat during this time? I know it's such a tough question right now when the state is facing a budget deficit, but in a perfect world, what do you think the state could do to help property tax uh, payers and homeowners? Well, we did make the 2% property tax cap permanent. So that, that helps take the sting. The largest share is of, of local property taxes are education, 60 to 70% of the local tax is, is a local school district. So what we need to be doing is we need to be funding education more through a progressive income tax, more state aid, um, and we've got to fix the foundation aid formula, which is based on you know, 10, 20 year old census data uh, and doesn't reflect the new trends, whether it's size of student population, whether it's demographics, whether it's uh, English sec uh, as, as a second language, English language learners, whether it's a number of disabled students, all of these things should be factored into the new foundation aid formula um, because the poorest districts don't have a property tax base to support their school districts the way wealthier ones do. When you say progressive income tax, uh, do you mean taxing the rich more or do you mean uh, just kind of a tax reform across the board? No, it would it would be on on the wealthiest New Yorkers. Um, it's only right that they pay their fair share. And education is where it starts, where equality starts, where opportunity starts. And we need to do a better job of state funding of our schools to take the burden off of overburdened property taxpayers and those districts that don't have the property tax base to support their schools. So I know Republicans in this year's election, in your race as well, are going to make the state's recent criminal justice changes a big issue of that race. Um, we're talking about the law that largely uh, ended the use of cash bail for low-level and nonviolent offenses. Um, I know Democrats are being asked across the state why they voted for it and if they support a rollback. What's your position on it? Do you think that the state's criminal justice laws should have changed, and do you support the laws as they are right now? They they had to change because. What we were seeing was disproportionate disparate impact on our black and brown communities and our poor communities. And somebody should not be jailed and deprived their freedom when they hadn't been convicted, they're nonviolent, when a wealthy person could get out for, for the very same uh, offense. So it was really unjust, it needed to change, and there was a lot of fear mongering going on right now, pointing to a spike in crime, and that's absolutely false. The New York Post and the New York Times both did studies using New York Police Department's own stats, and they categorically disproved that bail reform had anything to do with the spike in violence in New York City. 
All right, State Senator Pete Harcum, thanks so much for being here this week. Thank you so much for having me. When Harcum won his election two years ago, it was only by a few points. And Rob Astorino thinks he's got a good chance at taking the seat back this year for Republicans. A large part of the district is in Westchester County, where Astorino is not unpopular. He spent two terms as county executive and actually held the line on property taxes. We spoke this week about his message for voters and what he wants to do in the state Senate. Rob Astorino, thanks so much for being here. Hey, Dan, thank you. Anytime. So you were a former county executive in Westchester County where you did something that's kind of unheard of. You kept property taxes flat. Um, you might have uh, decreased them, I'm not sure, but I know that you definitely kept them flat for the most part. And like I said, in upstate New York and in New York City, that is unheard of. Now you're running for the state Senate, which obviously plays a bigger role in property taxes. What do you think the state should be doing to keep property taxes at bay in these districts upstate and in New York City that they're just growing at a rate that people can't keep up with? Well, there's no question. I actually did drop property taxes and it was hard work. And that really was why I got elected and why I chose to run back then. And it's also another reason why I chose, among many other reasons, to run for state Senate this year. Um, I, just in my own neighborhood, I see for sale signs everywhere and literally meeting new neighbors from Queens and Brooklyn and, and, and elsewhere because they're escaping New York City. So I do think there's a lot of things to tackle. You know, Medicaid was completely out of control. That's something that everyone needs to sit around the table and talk about in a realistic way without scaring people. Um, you know, property tax cap that is permanent is a good thing, and I certainly would have voted for that. But I think there's so many other things that we have to, to grapple with that, quite frankly, they, they want to avoid. And they're hoping and begging and praying for a bailout from D.C., which is not a policy. That just cannot happen. Um, so I, I do believe we need some relief and reform in a lot of these programs. You know, property taxes fund a lot of things, but primarily among them is education. Some yep. Democrats in the state legislature want to instead raise taxes on the wealthy to provide this funding source for education. I'm wondering, as somebody who's running for the state Senate, would you support a tax raise on the wealthy? Do you think that's the right way to go about filling the state's deficit? Or do you think that there's a different way to do it um, other than obviously getting some help from the federal government? I mean, the wealthy that are fleeing the state left and right down to Florida and other tax havens. Uh, no, I, that's the last thing that we should be doing in a state that's the highest taxed in America. So, no, I think, you know, what what the Democrats hate doing is making tough decisions. But we're at a point now where we need to make tough decisions. You know, first and foremost, we should set the goal of trying to be the most tax competitive state in the Northeast. OK, let's not bite the entire apple and try to be number one in, the, in America. We're not going to get there probably in my lifetime. But realistically, there's we've got some easy pickings with Connecticut and New Jersey and some other states that are all in a race to the bottom with New York on how miserable it could be with taxes. So it's the number one issue, property taxes, but also income taxes. You know, the state and local tax deduction, it hurt a little bit, there's no question, uh, but that shouldn't be the excuse that the governor and everybody is using to not really deal with the big issues. If you lower income taxes, there's going to be this gap where you can't, right now we're, we're really not putting a, a lot away for rainy day funds. If you lower income yeah. taxes, we're going to have less money in the coffers to pay for things. Do you think that there are areas where the state could spend less to uh, you know, meet what we would be bringing in with lower income taxes? The direction that this state is going in, it's already on its knees economically because of the policies in Albany, pre-pandemic and during this pandemic, you know, keeping us completely locked down and perpetuating this on and on while the economy is gasping for air uh, is not helpful. So I would absolutely sit down with everybody and talk about the big programs and the little. You can't tell me in a budget that's starting to approach $200 billion that you can't find some savings. It's just impossible to not find savings. And, and they came into this budget year and they added money to the budget on the come that they were going to get a bailout. That's not the way you handle things as adults. And we're seeing, honestly, we're seeing the detrimental effects to it as people escape New York in record numbers. Another top issue in this year's elections is going to be the state's recently passed criminal justice reforms, which yeah. largely eliminated cash bail for low level and nonviolent offenses. There is obviously some disagreement about that in the legislature, and I know that you want to roll those back. 
Um, tell me about your position on that, why you think they should be rolled back, and what you think should be done instead to change the criminal justice system to make it more fair. Well, these are not low level and these are not nonviolent offenses because assault is violence. Uh, there are many others that are, are just as bad. This was Peter Harkham's signature bill. I mean, he's the most proud of it. He said this is his, you know, he smiles when he talks about the no cash bail law. We see it's wreaking havoc in New York City. You have three New York City police commissioners, former and now the current one, saying that this is the reason. I mean, it, it, you don't have to connect the dots too far. It really goes from A to B. This no cash bail law has resulted in step B, a violence surge, shooting sur surge. And it's not just in New York City, by the way. Auto thefts are up 60% in Westchester County. There is no force field at the Bronx line. You see this anti-cop rhetoric that is a spin-off of this as well. Um, and, and it doesn't need to just be denounced. It needs to be stopped. And so the first thing I would do is repeal this law and, and yet sit down with people. And this was the failure of the law. They gave no judicial um, assistance on this or discretion. They had no law enforcement or um, district attorney uh, or judges who sat down and helped craft this law. And so you had a disastrous and a dangerous law that needs to be repealed. All right, Rob Astorino, we will be watching your election this fall. Uh, former Westchester County Executive, now running for State Senate. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you very much. We'll have to leave it there for this week. Thanks for watching this week's New York Now. Have a great week and be well. Funding for New York Now is provided by WNET.